we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. Even if I'm in this business, I still make mistakes. But the awareness of, oh, I should have probably worn something different, started that conversation differently, behaved a little bit different, is also something where you're already steps ahead of others who don't have that self-awareness. So don't be too tough on yourself, but realize if you do not control your brand, somebody else will control it. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week, I'm talking with Sylvie DiGiusto. Sylvie's an international keynote speaker and an expert in emotional intelligence, personal image, and leadership. And she's the best-selling author of Discover Your Fair Advantage. Leverage your unique selling points and human potential for work, business, and life. Sylvie and I discussed lessons from her book to help you leverage all the right gifts and attributes that are unique to you so that you can better stand out from the crowd. Whether you're looking to land your dream job, grow in your current career, or better market yourself and your services, you've got to be able to identify, develop, and communicate your unique attributes in a way that sets you apart from everyone else. And that's just what Sylvie and I discuss. So here it is. Here's my interview with Sylvie DiGiusto. Hi, Sylvie. Welcome to the show. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be with you. Well, I'm thrilled as well. It's my goal to make sure that you have a simple and a fun experience in this interview, along with making sure that we give a good experience to our audience. All right. That was seven seconds. How did I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a very loaded question and a great first question to dive into. Uh, and I can't tell you. I cannot tell you. You know, it's the most common question that I always receive and people understand that I study and speak about first and lasting impressions. And the reality is I can't tell you how good your first impression is because you didn't tell me what you want it to be. Uh -huh. So... First important learning here in order to find out what your first impression says about you, you first need to define what it should be. And in my uh, keynotes, I let audience members define it with one word. What is the one word that should pop up in everybody's mind when they think of you? What is the one word that should have instantly popped up if my, in my mind? When you just greeted me, maybe it is friendly, maybe it is creative, or is it trustworthy, or is it reliable, or is it powerful? And only if you tell me before what your first impression should say about you, then I can tell you if there was a gap and if you made your first seven seconds count or not. There you go. That's one of the ways that we can ensure that we're making the right first impression. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You need to define what it should be. Another trick that I use in my uh, keynotes is that I let people take out their phone. Maybe you at home now listening or watching this podcast, take out your phone too. And I encourage you to turn around the camera and take a selfie. But here's the most important rule. When you take that selfie, do not pose. You know, we are so used to the moment the lens is um, holding our face that we start to smile, that we try to pose. On top, we've put filters to make it picture perfect. But I want you to take a real selfie. Just look at the camera, how you assume that you look all day long, and then you will find out that, for example, 85% of the day we do not pose. And 85% of the day people see you just like that. And I cannot tell you if that is the first impression you would like to make or if it's something completely different. Wow. Okay. So that's a fun exercise. Besides taking that selfie, is there anything else that we can do to help us become more self-aware of the impression that we give? 
Well, first of all, you need to understand it's actually not so much about the seven seconds. That's just my marketing okay. tech line. And the result of one of the studies that I use for my work, but there is a variety of studies out there. Some say it takes 13 seconds. Some say it takes milliseconds. Some say online it takes way less than in person. And so the numbers really don't matter as much as you think. What matters more is that afterwards, very powerful sources are working against you. And those sources are called unconscious biases. So for example, when you meet with a client and in the first millisecond, seven seconds, 13 seconds, they have an impression of you. Unfortunately, unconscious biases will make sure that they are right, that they feel right. They might be totally wrong, but you know, our brain is always looking for proof. It wants to be right. One of the strongest biases is confirmation bias. And we look for confirmation of our first initial opinion. Or another bias is anchoring bias. We then anchor that information in our brain and just not cannot let go of it. Or the bandwagon effect, when a colleague also says something or a partner that goes into your direction, what you initially thought, of course we jump on that bandwagon. Or negativity bias. We always see the things that are wrong first, but we never see the things that we are doing right. And so it's less actually about the first impression that is just the beginning than about the many, many biases. We know about 175 biases that then can work against you or you make them work for you. So if you would have defined what your first impression should be, their biases will work in your favor too. They will see all the amazing things that you brought to the table in the first milliseconds of interacting with them. For example, your clients or your team members. So then what can we do to work with those biases? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, realize that they exist. And second, use them to your advantage. And I teach a framework, which I call the ABCDE framework. The A stands for your appearance, the B for your behavior, the C for your communication, the D for your digital footprint, and the E for the environment. If you don't mind, I quickly dive into those five areas that you know how you can use those tools in order to imprint something on your clients, for example, from the very first moment. Oh, please. Yeah. The A describes your visual intelligence. You know, we are visual creatures. We just like to look. Our brains are actually quite lazy. That's why they take a shortcut through our eyes. And so what does your visual appearance say about you? The body that you are born in, is it tall? Is it short? Is it overweight? Do you take care of it? Hopefully you cover it with clothes, at least in client meetings. What do they say about you? The fabrics, the styles, the colors, the fit, the patterns, the accessories, your hair, your makeup, and so on. Everything that we see, we are visual creatures. And that is the aim. But um, to be very clear, looking good is great, but it's not enough. Because then you are going to behave. Your behavior includes your attitude. It speaks louder than any words that you can say. And it's something that we instantly feel unconsciously, right? Or your business etiquette skills. Do you shake hands? Do you look somebody in the eyes? Do you let them sit down first or last? Those are all just tiny micro moments that might not be relevant to you, but very important to others. And then at one point, Communication plays a role. The C for communication or your verbal and non-verbal intelligence. Right. But surprisingly, the, the absolute most important part about communication is not talking. It is listening. How well of a listener are you in those first seven seconds? Do you actually speak or do you let the other person speak first? Or do you phrase questions to give them the opportunity to unconsciously feel that you care about them? And then obviously you speak your language patterns, your word choices, uh, your voice, the pace, the volume, everything that you say, or do you have an accent like I have, everything that could somehow distract from your words. And then the D, a little bit of a sweet spot of mine. Unfortunately, most first impressions nowadays are not made anymore in person. And you and I met are such a fantastic example. We have never met in person. 
Yet you saw something online maybe about myself where you thought, oh, this could be a guest for my podcast. But I bet you have also seen people online or people who wanted to be guests on your fantastic podcast where you thought, hmm, better not. So very often now we make decisions if we ever meet somebody in person based on their digital footprint. And that includes your emails, your virtual meetings, your social media. What do I find about you on Google? And then it's your environment, the environment you operate in, the people you surround yourself, the car that you drive, the vacations you go on, your house, that, uh, your apartment that you live, everything that surrounds you that people also take into consideration. And only if you craft those pieces together, right, then you have a very powerful instrument to influence how people perceive you. But most importantly, you know, you can't look great, but behave horrible. Uh, you can't hang out with the Kardashians and hope that people perceive you as the Pope. So it's it's the combination out of all those five elements that allow you to influence how people perceive you and how afterwards unconscious biases are working for you or against you. And oh my goodness. That is a lot. But when you think of everything that falls within each of those letters, A, B, C, D, E, all those different things, that's so much to, to keep track of. So what can we do to make sure that everything feels more like a flow, like it's not too much effort, like it's not too overwhelming to keep track yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, first of all, always keep in mind you are doing the best you can. The moment you start thinking about it and trying to control some of those pieces, you are already steps ahead from others who just run through life on autopilot. Second, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. Even if I'm in this business, I still make mistakes. But the awareness of, oh, I should have probably worn something different, started that conversation differently, behaved a little bit different. It's also something where you are already steps ahead of others who don't have that self-awareness. So don't be too tough on yourself, but realize if you do not control your brand, somebody else will control it. That's right. That's the reality. If you don't create your stories, then somebody else will write your story for you. And in the worst case, in places where you aren't even present. You know, when we think of our personal brand and reputation, it's not what we say it is. It's mm -hmm. what other people say it is about us. Exactly, exactly. And you know, the, the difficulty is when I ask people, so what is your personal brand? Tell me about it. It is something that is really difficult to describe. And that's why we always take that shortcut and talk about logos and websites and marketing taglines and everything that is so easy to grab. But the reality is your personal brand that is you and everything that is unique about you. And when I ask people, what is unique about you? The answers are usually quite average and always go more towards comparing your brand to somebody else. Saying, you know, my brand, I'm more professional or I'm more trustworthy or I'm more of this. I deliver faster uh, services, uh, higher quality. And now we say that that is not your brand because then you bring yourself into a comparison trap. I will always find somebody out there who says, nah, I'm a better podcast host than Matt. Right. Not true because you are the best one, right? But what is that one thing that you can offer that nobody else can offer? And hence, I spent the last three and a half years writing this little book, not so little, actually, 461 yeah. pages, Discover Your Fair Advantage, to take you on that journey of self-discovery to find out what is really your brand and how can you purposefully imprint this on other people. When we see somebody that's really successful or someone that has a big milestone or a big achievement, sometimes there's always going to be somebody that says, well, they had an unfair advantage. Exactly. But 
you flip that around and you say, no, here's here's how to have a fair advantage. So how do you distinguish between a fair advantage versus an unfair advantage? Yes, yeah. You have someone like we instantly go into the areas where we say, well, you know, they are born into this wealthy family. Or the, their square one was just a different one than mine. But that really doesn't matter. Your fair advantage is what you bring to the table. And it is so unique that nobody else in this combination will bring the same to the table. And so throughout that book, I take you on that journey to answer 15, 15 very difficult questions about you and your fair advantage that will help you to identify what is unique about you, what do only you possess and nobody else, and how do you phrase it in a way that it encourages others to listen or even to talk about you behind your back and your fair advantage. Because in the book, I also describe four levels of visibility. Right. The first one is, to blend in, to not be seen. And some do that purposefully. If you want to do that, go ahead, right? And they are good. But some do it not purposefully and wonder why does nobody see me? The second level is a little bit higher. People do see you, but they don't see you for the right things. I was in that level myself for many years. I was kind of successful in my role in corporations. But I was known as the busy bee. Everything that people dropped off on my table will be taken care of. Right. And so I never got promoted because they knew whatever they bring to me will help them to get promoted. And I'm going to take care of it, right? Until finally I found a mentor who saw something in me and moved me into visibility level three that I got known for a specific skill or talent or knowledge that I had. But the kind of um, visibility on steroids is visibility for I needed somebody else in a different room talking about me in the right moment when an opportunity came up saying, I think that is a project that Sylvie could take care of. I, I, I don't have the stats or the research to back this up. But my understanding from stories and then even my own personal experience, a lot of times when we get those really big opportunities that, that come our way, a lot of times they come because somebody was in some other room talking to somebody else. They heard about that opportunity and they know what our skills are. They know what we're good at. Mm -hmm. They know what's unique about us and they know what our passion is and all those things combined says, hey, Sylvie is the right person for this opportunity here. We should go talk to her about this. Exactly, exactly. I call it being referable. Your yes, end right. goal cannot just be being known. Your end goal should be to be referable that when an opportunity arises, there is no other chance other than dropping your name. But now when it comes to... Uh, being referable when it comes to having what you talk about as that fair advantage, I think sometimes people may not have the right understanding of what their fair advantage is. Sometimes we may, th we may think, well, this is what my fair advantage needs to be. And on the other side, I've got some of these weaknesses, some of these things that may be unique to me, but they're, but I see them as weaknesses. And so I want to downplay those. And there, there seems to be a disconnect. Yes. Um, I'd love to know from you, is it possible to take some of those perceived weaknesses and turn them into a fair advantage? Yes, absolutely. First of all, the third part of the book is all about self-sabotaging your fair advantage, right? Yeah. Something so that is just human nature to have a negative self-talk, to criticize, to, to be your own worst critic. Uh, but I give you an example out of those 15 questions. One of the questions is, what do you do different than your competitor? So I want all of you now think of your competitor, whoever it is. It can be a different organization, a different brand, a different person outside of your organization. It can be your colleague or your boss because you want to have their job. So whoever that competitor is, just grab one. And now, Tell me, what do you do 
different than your competitor. And as I said in the beginning, most people come up with, well, you know, I offer better services. I deliver faster results. Make promises that I promise you, if I would walk over to that competitor you just chose and I would ask them, tell me about your services. They would say, well, my services are way better than theirs and we deliver way faster than they do, right? So very often when we think of competition, we think only of the things that we do better, but not what we do different. The one thing that our competitor cannot offer. So let me share, if you don't mind, a story from my personal life. Oh, please. Yeah. Years ago, when I was uh, living in New York City, in a city that never sleeps and that has all the media outlets, I got a call uh, from um, a media outlet and they said, would you mind coming into the studio and talk about a politician tonight, about the perception of this politician? And I said, sure, especially at the beginning of your career, you take any media opportunity opportunity that you have. I jumped into a cab, googled quickly the name about the person I'm supposed to talk about because honestly, I didn't have much idea. Right. Walked into the studio and found myself within political experts talking about this person. And somehow I got invited back and back and back and became kind of a regular guest on that show. But Matt, when I watched the show in the evening myself on the TV, I hated it. It was painful. Why? There were all those well-spoken American political experts. They had picture-perfect English. They used words so sophisticated that I didn't even know what they meant. And then this. Not sure if you have noticed, but I have an accent. You hear a Spanish <laughs> My father, yes, said an Italian grandfather, a French father, an Austrian mother. So the viewers had to go through this mess here. And it was one of the weaknesses I had that bothered me the most and that had such an impact on my self-esteem. So a few months forward, I got invited to the holiday party. And I find myself sitting with the producer of that show. And I share exactly those feelings with him. And I point to my mouth and say, I cannot understand why you invite me again and again. And he says to me, that changed the trajectory of my career. He says, that's the reason why we invite you. Because first, you sound like an international expert. And second, you say things so simple that each of our viewers understands you while they don't understand the political experts. Ta-da! Here I am nowadays, totally embracing my accent. And when I look into my clientele, I find that nine out of 10 conferences I speak at are for an international organization or are in front of international audiences. I found something that none of my competitors can imitate, can be better. I mean, they can't come up with a better accent like this, right? No. It is something unique about me. It's my fair advantage. Nothing that I fake, nothing that I came up with that is naturally engraved in me that I realized, wow, it's actually not a weakness. It's one of my superpowers. That's it. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to one of the problems that we can have when we're trying to figure out what our fair advantage is, when we're trying to figure out what our unique selling points are, if we do that work alone, we may not get the right answer. And so I think that speaks to the power of tapping into our friends, our colleagues, our leaders, our mentors to help us understand that. Yes. Why into my book? Because I've raised, I think, around 250 questions. It's like a mix yes. of a workbook and a textbook to you to figure that out. Because very often we don't even think about areas that are so relevant. If I may, I give you another example. Oh, yeah. When we think of our fear advantage, we instantly navigate and gravitate towards our skills, the things that we have learned 
in school, in training, in education, in books. You know, there's the knowledge that we have been taught or taught ourselves. And that is important. You have skills that I don't have and I have skills that you don't have. But what about your natural talents? You and I and everybody listening is born with a unique set of natural talents. You came on planet Earth and something was always easier for you than anybody else to you. It just came natural to you. So when you go into your childhood, go back into your childhood, you might, might think of something where you just were naturally great at. Might be that you remember that from small on you were a great con connector with people, a great communicator, or very competitive to you were somewhere in sports or very creative. And very often we underestimate how valuable those natural talents are, because the reality is we never have to learn them throughout our career. So unfortunately, very often we bury them for work because there is no proof, there is no education, there are no seminars that we sign up because it comes naturally to us. And in fact, when we look at others and they don't have that talent, we get so angry and think, why is this so difficult for you? It's yeah. so easy for me. Well, because it's your natural talent. And those are the things that we discover in that book. You know, unique selling points, you might not even think about that they are your superpowers right now. Yeah. And, and when it comes to those things that are natural to us, I think that a lot of people have that tendency to think because it's natural to me, it's really not that special because I didn't have to do any training or learning to acquire the skill because it's natural. It's really not a big deal. Whereas everybody else that doesn't have that natural skill can see it and see how, mm -hmm. how amazing it really is. Yeah. 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 Another example. Tell me a fun fact about you, Matt. Tell me a fun fact. Something that only a small group of people knows. Um, I have a love for music and vinyl. I have a large collection of vinyl records. So what does collecting items say about you and your characteristics and your traits? Um, I mean, I would say it's, it's a deep love and appreciation of art. Mm -hmm. It's a deep love and appreciation of something that drives my emotions. Like when I listen to music and when I listen to one full album, I mean, like it's able to tap into my emotions. Mm -hmm. So I, I, heard, I heard focus. I heard creativity. Um, I heard that um, persistency. I mean, others would just give up after a while, right? And not continue that. Um, I, for example, I run buildings. I go into stinky dark stairwells and run up you the... run, like you 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 run up yeah. stairwells? Yes, yes, yes. So I okay. ran the uh World Trade Center, I ran the Rockefeller Center, the Empire State Building, um the Eiffel Tower, I run buildings. So that's my fun fact. First of all, people always that doesn't say, sound very fun. <laughs> So people always say, tell me more, yeah. right? They want to know, yes. how does it work and why would anybody do that? Yeah. But again, it's not so much about what you do. It's what that, what does it say about you? What does it say about my discipline, for example, or my determination or my competitive thinking? So again, there are things that are unique selling points about you where at the moment you might not think that they are your superpowers. But from the outside, from the perception of others, they think, wow, I think for this project, we need somebody who is really persistent, who will not give up. You know what? Did you ever hear that Matt has a collection since 25 years and 4,000 yeah. albums? Yeah. This is the trick, to give them something, a fair advantage that you have in you and that speaks for you. Sometimes, like, you know, it, it takes people... Asking the right questions, knowing those right questions, ask it. Okay, so what is it about this fun fact that gives you certain skills? That gives you certain talents. Mm -hmm. I have an idea, Matt, and we didn't discuss this before, so I apologize. But how oh, about oh, right. everybody listening to this episode shares their fun fact with you, either via email or uh, on social media? 
oh, you yes. picked the most fun fact and let me know, and I'm going to send them a free copy of my book. How does that Whoa. sound? I love that. Yes. Put it in the show notes. I'll put it in social. You can email me, matt at mattliles.com, and let me know what's your fun fact. Hashtag fun fact. Thanks, yes. Cool. Love it. Thank you. What an awesome gift. Absolutely. But uh, keep it appropriate. We only want to have the appropriate fun facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my eyes can't handle the uh, inappropriate stuff. Please don't share. So we've, we've talked about some of the uh, 15 different unique selling points. What are some of your other favorites that people might not recognize, that people might not say, oh, that's not necessarily like my go-to when I think of trying to figure out my fear advantage? Uh, let's talk about accomplishments and achievements. When I ask my audiences or my readers about the accomplishments and achievements they have had throughout their career, they instantly gravitate towards the big things, you know? Well, we all want to win an Oscar and an Emmy, right? Or we all want to have right. this huge accomplishment. But the reality is, if you would ever take the time and sit down what you accomplish just on a daily base, you would be so surprised. And so I force you in my book or in my keynotes to go back in time and write down your accomplishments in two areas. The one are performance-based accomplishments. The other one are recognition-based accomplishments. Performance-based are, let's say, you work in customer care. Did you ever count or guess how many thousands customers you have helped so far? Did you ever take the time to realize what an impact this might have had on revenue in your organization? Yes. Right? Or you are a marketer. Did you ever sit down and Really bring all your marketing initiatives on paper with what I call an XYZ method, filling in the numbers. I have run 70 campaigns in the last 12 months leading to what, right? And the other ones are recognition-based, testimonials that you have received, awards that you have received, certifications that you got, where somebody else recognizes you for what you have done. And you know, it's one of my favorites because I, there is a physical experience in the room that people out of a sudden get wider shoulders, sit upright, smile, and look with pride on that list. Because unfortunately, we never take the time to realize and to find out what we accomplish on a day-to-day -day base. It's a good reminder to ourselves, too. One of the practices that I got into halfway in my career, I wish I'd started at the very beginning of my career, but at least I started halfway, is any time that somebody sent me any sort of email testimony, whether it was from leadership my immediate management or my colleagues or any other peers, anything that was just like a positive comment about what I did in my work, I filed it away in a little folder that I called accolades. Yeah. And whenever I needed to go through an exercise of learning like, well, what have my accomplishments been? I could yeah. tap into those. But also on those days where I was feeling down about myself or needed an opportunity to really pump myself up to, you know, get my shoulders back and my head held up, I would go into that folder and start reading those and realize, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I have accomplished some things. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's it's one of the chapters in the book too, clients and praise, because really do we take the time to define what others actually praise us for? And here's why. I'll give you an example. Did your parents, when you were young, ever say, well, if your friend would jump off a cliff, would you jump yeah. after them? Yeah. Mine have said that very often. And back then I said, no, of course I wouldn't, right? Nowadays I'm kind of, you know what? Jumping off a cliff actually sounds a little bit fun, right? And if it's a Pins friend. on the cliff. <laughs> right? 
And maybe after a glass of soap in your blow and uh, some fun discussions, uh, I'm going to jump off from just experience it. Clients also like to jump off cliffs others have before. Oh, yes. So if you collect all, and I call them love notes, yes. everything that somebody said positively about you, that they praised you for something, I promise you there will be a moment where you need them, either for yourself because you have failed in the same area and you just need the confirmation, I have done this before and it was just this time that I failed, but especially for others because others jump easier off that cliff with you if somebody else has done it before. It's a lot easier to be second in line. Yes, yes. Instead of the first. Okay, so we, we can do all this work around defining our unique selling points. It's one thing to define it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to communicate it and to communicate your unique selling points to communicate your fair advantage. What's mm -hmm. the ideal way for us to go about communicating our fair advantage? Short and concise and creative. Uh, nobody likes to read long bios. Nobody likes to read long stories. And nobody likes to read boring stories or listen to right. boring stories. So with each of those unique selling points, I give you an advice on how to phrase it in a way that is appealing to others. So for example, rather than talking about my accent and pointing out what I just shared with you, because nobody wants to read through that long story, when it comes to my multicultural background, I phrase it like this. I am Austrian by birth, French in my heart, Italian in my kitchen, German in my work ethic, but American by choice. And that is a phrase that makes people always smile and think. I could have said that in a very different and boring, yes. factual way, right? Yes. Uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult if you have to communicate things that are sensitive. One of the chapters is about volunteerism and advocacy. And we all have our own political opinions. We all have our own religious backgrounds. We all have our own past, for example. Right. And so there are a few sensitive topics where you need to be very careful in communicating them because you can always offend somebody. And so in, in the book, I give you, especially for those sensitive topics, advice how to communicate them. And I, for example, talk about past experiences and you have experienced something negative in your past that is part of your fear advantage, then it's important to share this. But you don't want to share this in a way to make others feel bad, right? You, you want to create interest. So I rather recommend to go in the learnings, talk more about the learnings you have taken away from that traumatic past experience, rather than sharing the past experience in every single detail, right? Or when it comes to issues like political opinions, don't talk about right or left. Talk about the common goal that we all have. It doesn't really matter on which side that you are, but we all have a common goal, right? So there are a few sensitive topics that I help you to phrase within the book. But other than that, short and concise and unique and creative, this must be something that people want to listen to. And this can end up in a written statement, like in the book, where I encourage you to write a unique selling proposition. But I use those elements in my email signature. My email signature says, for example, I'm an international keynote speaker and wearer of many hats. Multitasking, right? Or it can be part of your elevator pitch. Or it can be part of a greeting at the very beginning, your introduction. So there, I give you many, many places where you can apply those unique selling points. And it sounds like when you apply it in that way, it's in a way that encourages the audience or, who, or whoever you're speaking to, whoever you're communicating to, it encourages them 
to want to lean in and say, oh, tell me more about that instead of just hearing, oh, okay, well, thanks for sharing. Either you want them to say, tell me more, or you are the one who says, tell me more, right? Of course. Um, very often we make the mistake that we try to sound interesting and make everything about ourselves. But the reality is we should sound interested and make it always about the audience or the person in front of us. That's it. Yeah. Being able to focus on the audience and serve them first. Well, Sylvie, I have learned a lot from you and I thank you for answering all these questions, but I have one more question for you. If you were to create a five song playlist for Discover Your Fair Advantage, what songs would you include? What a fantastic question that it is. And I'm going to start off with my favorite song ever. And I'm just going to make it work that it fits to fear advantage. Well, it actually fits a little bit. In one of the chapters, I talk about self-care, how important it is to take care of yourself. And my self-care routine starts every morning. Behind that wall, there is the ocean. And I step on uh, my boat and I drive out to watch the sunrise. And I listen to Edith Piaf, Je ne regrette rien. I don't oh. regret anything. And You, then you play morning. that song every single morning. Every single morning. One of the next songs that I play when I cruise, when I cruise really fast, when I want to have energy, then I play JC, Caught Their Eyes. It's such a oh. good, such a good vibe, but it is about wealth and fame and the pressure that comes with it. Discovering your free advantage is not for the faint of heart. You are giving out a lot of information about yourself. And some people might not like that or might not be able to handle that. It has a lot to do with the self-confidence that you need to put yourself out there and make you as visible as you possibly deserve. The third, it's a beautiful day by you too. Oh, yes. Very big old U2 fan, and this lady is about being optimistic and rather seeing the things that are good than seeing the things that are wrong. Remember what I told you about my perceived weakness. Right. Then the story by Brandy Carline. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because discover your fair advantage gives you the opportunity to share your story authentically. And in a way that others say, tell me more about your story. I really want to know more. And last but not least, The Greatest Show. The oh, Greatest Show yeah. Man. There are several lists on that, uh, several songs on that playlist, but it's all right. about being authentic and being unique. And there is no better thing than knowing yourself so well that you know which of your authentic parts can you put on center stage and which one do you maybe hold a little bit back in order to really leverage your fair advantage. Very cool insight there from those songs. Thank you for playing along with that. Oh, well, thank you for asking such a great question. Well, Sylvie, I have learned so much from you. I've learned so much from our talk today, but where can people go to learn more? They can go on uh, Amazon and grab uh, a copy of Fear Advantage, my latest book, or they can go on my website, uh, sylviedechuster.com. Uh, if you go there, look out for the perception audit. It is a free audit that you can take for 10 minutes where I ask you some difficult questions about yourself, yeah. and then you will get a personalized report about how the world sees you and perceives you, what pops up in their mind when they think of you. Uh, after that, you will end up on my email list. Fair warning. I uh, want you to know you're going to be signed up automatically. I hope that you find the content valuable. If not, unsubscribe at any moment. I'm going to be fine. I have a therapist, right? I'm going to feel fine. Don't worry about me. And you find me everywhere on social media. And I would love to hear from you. Just connect with me. And don't forget to share your fun fact with Matt. And maybe a free copy will show up in your mailbox. That's right. Yes, share your fun fact with me. 
either on any of the social postings around this or email it directly to me, matt at mattliles.com. Let me know your fun fact. And you could get your own copy of Discover Your Fear Advantage. Sylvie, thank you so much. And thank you very much for having me. It takes a great podcast host who asks great questions so that you can give good and valuable answers. I'm so glad that I was with you. Uh, I really appreciate your invitation. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Sylvie DiGiusto. You can learn more from her by going to sylviedigiusto.com slash audit. I've got that link in the show notes. From there, you'll get access to a free survey and report that helps you better understand how others perceive you professionally, along with the steps you can take to ensure that they see you the way that you want them to. And if you want to dive deeper into some of the lessons we discussed today, then go grab your copy of Discover Your Fair Advantage. It'll help you understand the best ways to stand out from the crowd, boost your confidence, and excel in your career. But... Before you buy your copy of Discover Your Fair Advantage, here's your chance to win a free copy. Just like Sylvie and I discussed in the episode, you can win your own copy just by letting me know your fun fact that helps you stand out. You can let me know by tagging me via LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, or Twitter with the hashtag SimpleBrandPodcast. Or if you want to send it to me privately, you can do that by emailing me at matt at mattliles.com. Sylvie and I will pick out the most fun, fun fact, and I'll reach out and make sure your copy is shipped directly to you. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button because it's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Karen Hurt. Karen and I discuss lessons from her book, Courageous Cultures, How to Build Teams of Micro-Innovators, problem solvers, and customer advocates. Listen, if you've ever been concerned that your employees aren't proactively solving problems when they notice them, if you've ever been surprised that your employees aren't speaking up enough, even when you think you have an open door policy, then this episode is for you. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Karen's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Simple.